this. All right. Let me practice. Nope. Yeah, maybe it has to be on. Yeah. That helps. <laughs> you don't want to appear in the video, you know. <laughs> oh, here you go. Okay, it works. Just go down. Go down there. To advance, you have to go down? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right. Okay, all right. Uh, okay. All right, so... Um, so what we will uh, try today, today, to finish, uh, I mean, I review a little bit uh, important sampling. There is a lot of details that I left out. You know, we went very fast when it comes to convergence. But since we're going to cover sequential Monte Carlo methods later on uh, in early November, I'm going to come back to those slides because they are important uh, uh, research-wise. So what I'm going to do is give, uh, the main topic is going to be give sampling. Uh, but I am going to try to review a little bit uh, important something and give you some uh, weird application uh, just to motivate you that with statistics you can do anything you want to. Uh, all right. So, uh, as a reminder, I will assume this is the light. No. Nope. Oh, maybe this one. Yes. All right. So, I remind you basically. If we have to compute things like the expectation of some function h of x with a distribution f, and f is a difficult distribution to sample from, what we do is we introduce uh, this uh, importance distribution q, and rather than sampling from f, we sample from q, and effectively what we need to do is keep track of the weights. Uh, so we have to adjust basically uh, what we integrate where we take these averages is not of h, but h times f over q. Um, and uh, we discuss uh, both the normalized and normalized versions of uh, important sampling. So I'm not going to give you all the details. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, if you want to estimate this with standard Monte Carlo, you get something that looks like that. OK? So, uh, it's exactly as your vanilla Monte Carlo. The only difference is every sample comes with the weight f divided by q. Again, f is the target distribution. The notation may be slightly different from before, and q is this important sampling distribution. Okay. Um, the only really guarantee that you need to uh, satisfy here is uh, that q basic. You remember when we did accept reject. Uh, type of uh, algorithms we have, we said Q has to be on the top of the target distribution, uh, uh, in this case, F. So the same is true here. So since we sample from Q, this needs to be satisfied. And more importantly, uh, the distribution Q has to be fatter tails than the target distribution F. Okay? And certainly, in regions where uh, the distribution is positive, uh, Q has to be positive. All right? Uh, there are many criteria for uh, guaranteeing that important sampling is going to work. And uh, effectively, this is the first term from the variance of the function H. So this thing has to be finite. OK? Uh, there are much more simpler forms. Basically, the most simpler form would be that the weights basically don't blow up. So that the ways the absolute values are less than infinity, uh, uh, and that would be actually, if, if that's the case, this will also be satisfied. Okay. So, um, which means, uh, don't be uh, choosing Q that is uh, uh, anything without actually checking that the weights have finite variance. Certainly, this can uh, get you in trouble in high dimensions, and I think we did one example uh, in the earlier lecture. All right. Uh, I want to do, you know, we will uh, revisit this when we do sequence Monte Carlo, but I wanted to do sort of a little uh, uh, perturbation of uh, important sampling that goes with the name uh, uh, sampling importance resampling. So the algorithm is called SIR, and it is a very popular algorithm. So let me very briefly describe 
what we do to important sampling to simplify things. So you agree with me that if you do important sampling, you sample from a distribution Q, and then the approximation, the Monte Carlo approximation of P, is this delta function centered on each sample times the weights. Right? I mean, this is what we came about in uh, the previous lecture. Okay? So if you calculate the expectation of any function, effectively you will get the values of the function at excess times the weights and then summation on S. All right? So that's the Monte Carlo approximation for important sampling where the samples excess come from the distribution Q. All right, so think now that you do the following thing. Um, think of resampling from this distribution in, uh, in, uh, uh, with probabilities that they are proportional to the weights WS. So effectively think of resampling uh, particle S, right, and I call them this excess particles S, okay, with probabilities that correspond to a discrete distribution with weights W1, W2, W capital S. You remember how to sample from a discrete distribution? We did this in the very first lecture. The idea here is I want to simplify this approximation. Why do I want to simplify? Because maybe I have some samples with huge weights and some other samples that are basically irrelevant. So why summing over something that has very little weight? So if I resample from this distribution proportionally to each of these weights, I will only resampling particle success that have significant weight. The rest will not be sampled, will not be important. Okay? So uh, when you do this, effectively, so, if you, so here's the idea. So Ws of the normalized importance weight, and we're going to sample excess with probabilities that they are proportional to this weight's Ws. And what I have here is a little proof that uh, effectively uh, the new distribution that is going to come uh, from this process, it actually is equivalent to this original distribution. So let me uh, go uh, very fast through the derivation. Uh, can you look at this? So this p hat is the distribution that is going to be derived from this if I resample uh, with probabilities proportional to the weights Ws. So look at this equation first and tell me where, so this is like the CDF of this new distribution after resampling. Tell me from where this thing is coming from and if it is familiar. So I said I'm going to resample the way I resample from discrete distributions, all right? And uh, the discrete distributions basically uh, would be with probabilities Ws. So does this remind you anything? This equal to that. You remember this is the indicator function, right? So I'm looking for this new distribution that comes after resampling. This is like the CDF, is the probability that x is less than a given value. And here what I do is I put the indicator function times Ws. So from where is this coming? This is the CDF of what type of distribution? Does this remind you the CDF of uh, any distribution we have seen? How do you compute the CDF of a discrete distribution? Do you compute it like this? No? I mean, you are summing basically all the ways, right, for the particles that are less or equal to x0. Because I said I'm going to resample proportionally to the weights. All right? So this is the CDF of the discrete distribution that comes from the weight that I resample. And then what I do is, I uh, substitute the weights as the ratio of p over q, where for p, this p currently is the unnormalized distribution p, okay? Uh, you remember, you know, when you use the unnormalized weights, then you also have to uh, put the normalization factor here on the, on the uh, bottom. So this is the unnormalized weights divided by uh, this normalization factor, where you sum over all particles, and then 
uh, just to make calculations easy, I make the summations integrals. And because x are coming from the distribution q of x, so this looks like that, this integrals. Okay? And q and q cancel out, q and q cancel out. And this curly of p divided by this normalization factor, it gives you the distribution p of x. And this gives you nothing else but the CDF of the original distribution p. The idea here is if you resample from this, right, you're actually getting an approximation of the exact uh, CDF uh, of the distribution of interest. Now, why do you want to resample from this? Because you will get rid of lots of the particles that have very small weights. And more importantly, uh, the distribution will look like a standard Monte Carlo approximation where the weights would be one over the number of particles that you sample from. So the fact that you sample proportionally to the weights, the weights disappear from the picture. And the Monte Carlo approximation, you remember if you have n samples, you have 1 over n. So here we have 1 over s prime, where s prime is the number of samples uh, in the resampling process. And this number of samples is significantly less than this s, because many of these particles that we had in this approximation uh, will actually not appear there. We have very small weights, so you will never sample them. Uh, bottom line is, right, when you look at papers, even though they do important something, you may wonder, where are the weights? Well, the weights have disappeared because maybe at every step of the process, when you have an approximation like this equation at the top, you resample, and then the approximation looks like what you see on the bottom. This is very standard type of calculation that you do with important sampling, okay? Especially if, uh, as we will see, if it is a dynamic problem and you have to come up with approximations like this, let's say, in time. Uh, so in every time, what you would like to do is uh, resample, get the approximation, look like that, and then uh, proceed to the next time step. We will see this. Uh, if you didn't get it clearly, we will see this again when we do a sequential important sampling. All right. So let me do a weird application, as I promise. And there are many things that somebody can do. We can spend many lectures on this. Uh, if I ask you, uh, you know, solving AEX equal to B, how you are going to do it, maybe you forgot, all right? But AEX equal to B uh, is sort of the most fundamental problem in, uh, in uh, all sort of computations. Everything at the end of the day becomes AEX equal to B. And the question is, can we actually solve AEX equal to B <coughs> using important sampling? There's nothing stochastic here. A is a matrix, B is a vector, X is a vector. We want to solve uh, AX equal to B uh, using important sampling. So that looks um, uh, weird to start with. Uh, is that possible? All right. So uh, let me first uh, uh, do some tricks and, and uh, they work in most practical cases. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply with the matrix G, all right? Uh, and then I'm going to set G times A equal to I minus B. And I'm going to design this matrix G in such a way that the spectral radius of B is less than 1. You remember what is the spectral radius of a matrix? It's the largest eigenvalue of the matrix, OK? Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, the you will see a reason why you want the largest eigenvalue to be less than 1, okay? Because effectively, we're going to do sort of a Taylor series expansion. So uh, look at this now. If g a equal i minus b, I call this h. So really, my equation becomes i minus b times x equal to h. And you know, you remember the Taylor series expansion, 1 divided by 1 minus x? Does it click? 1 divided by 1 minus x? Now, you remember? 1 divided by 1 minus x. What's the Taylor series expansion? One plus x plus x squared plus x cubed, no? Come on, you have your computers, you know. Just say Taylor series expansion, one divided by one minus x. Okay? All right. So uh, 
the Taylor series expansion is basically, so remember we have i minus b times x equal to h. So uh, uh, it's really the i minus b inverse times h, that's the solution x. And the inverse in the Taylor series expansion is nothing else but this summation on b to the power k times h. All right? So the solution of the linear system of equations is this infinite summation from k equal to 0 of b to the power k times h. Can you appreciate now the reason why I wanted the eigenvalues to be the maximum eigenvalue to be less than 1? Because otherwise the b to the power k, right, when you take b to the power k in a spectral form is the eigenvalues to the power k, you want to be sure that that thing doesn't blow up. Okay? So, uh, so the solution basically of a linear system of equations is written as x equal v to the power k times h, and you may say, yeah, who cares? Uh, where is the important subject? All right. So let's see. So I am going to write this. Uh, so here I have v to the power k. How do you multiply v k times? You multiply v times b times b times b, right? K times. Don't you do actually b times i i1 b times in component form i1 i2? How do you multiply matrices? b i k minus 1 i k in k steps, and then you sum over all these indices. How do you multiply matrices? Right? This way? Okay. So the solution, and you notice here, by the way, I write uh, uh, one of the components of the vector x. And that's actually an amazing result you will see shortly because in all existing methods for solving Ax equal b, you compute all of the x together. Here, I am writing one equation that involves each of the components of x separately. So we may, we may be able to compute each of the components of x separately, and that can be a very significant step, right? If really you don't care about the whole x, you only want one component, here is a calculation uh, that gives you that one component. Again, uh, you notice here there's like k steps, i, i1, i2, i, k, right, to do this b to the power k. So there are k steps, and then I sum for all possible steps k, times h k, all right? And uh, where is the important sampling, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce, uh, just to have a compact notation, this indices i1, i2, i, k, I'm going to call them gamma k, and they're basically a sequence of indices from 1 to n, each of them, uh, and there are k of those indices, that's why I put the subscript k, all right? So remember here it says sum from k is 0 to infinity, and then over all these possible indices, i1, i2, ik minus 1, ik, so effectively, uh, uh, this is how the equation looks like. xi, uh, if I call all of this thing, you know, if k is positive, I call this this product. If k equal to 0, I call this hi. The solution xi is really the summation over all possible gamma k's, all possible indices, you can see here, all possible indices of alpha i computed at gamma k, which means alpha i computed at a given sequence of k steps defined by i1, i2, i k. So, summary. Uh, we can write the component xi as the summation over all possible indices that involve these k steps, okay? Uh, and summation of the alpha is defined, it, defined for given uh, indices gamma k, okay? And this coefficient alpha i is given explicitly by the derivation from what you see here. Can you give me a statistical interpretation of that equation? We may have seen something like that before. It's obviously discrete there, so you don't see uh, anything expectations, but can you guess how we can make this to look a statistical equation. It says xi is the summation of the alpha i's for all possible indices of size k. Now forget Gibbs sampling. We haven't said anything about Gibbs sampling. I want to know, 
Can we write this equation in a statistical way? Right when, remember the definition of expectation. What do you do when you have expectation? Of a function under some distribution. You multiply the function of distribution and you take an integral over all possible values or summation over all possible values. So uh, there's no integration here, but there's a summation. And I don't see a distribution, so is there any hidden distribution there? Uniform distribution over indices. So effectively, the problem is nothing else but the expectation of uh, this coefficient alpha i gamma k over the uniform distribution over indices of length k. Okay. Now, and I write it like that because uh, this distribution is not normalizable, so you cannot write exactly you know, like this. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the notation. So uh, this is where important now something is going to come. Okay, w rather than something from this uh, distrib uniform distribution of our indices, we're going to create uh, a new uh, proposal distribution Q. Uh, that will allow us to sample the indices. And effectively, we're going to approximate this. We're going to approximate this with basically uh, the uh, uh, expectation under this distribution Q of alpha i divided by Q. These are the weights. You see that, right? It's like, you know, you say multiply by Q, divide by Q. So uh, the ratio of alpha i by q is what you see here, and the rest is the expectation under this proposed distribution q. Of course, this can only be useful if this proposed distribution q uh, is something reasonable you can program in one line of the code. Okay? So again, xi is the component of the vector in ax equal b any component, and it comes out that this is the expectation under any proposal distribution at this point. Uh, and this is a proposal distribution of the indices of size k of this uh, ratio of the weights alpha i divided by q for the given uh, uh, gamma k that defines uh, 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 this sequence. So what do we do with q? What do we select as q? And so we're going to take uh, a random walk of k steps. So this is uh, maybe uh, for this course, the first time that you see the concept of random walk, which is fundamental to uh, many different problems in statistics and stochastic modeling. So we're going to take a random walk of k-steps. And remember, the proposed distribution, in principle, has very little constraints. It can be anything, right? So uh, the random walk will do it for us. So this is how it's going to work. This proposal Q for a given sequence of gamma k will consist of a transition probability. You remember I start from i. I always start from i, right? And I end basically at k where I stop, okay? Because this is a, length, a chain of length k. So I take this proposal distribution for given gamma k as the transition probability from going from i to i1 a transition probability of going from i1 to, to i2, from ik minus 1 to ik. And then because I need to stop on this uh, k steps only, I need to have a stopping probability pik. And so the stopping probability would be 1 minus all of these transition probabilities. And you may say, and what do I select for transition probabilities? The answer is anything you want that is less than 1. All right, so you say I have. Uh, you know, in this one, two, three, four. So from one, I can go to one, or I can go to two, or I can go to three, I can go to four. All right. So if you have k steps, there is um, uh, a probability where uh, you stop, right? And because you have a probability for stopping, you don't really need when you implement this to define k a priori. So you don't need to say what k is when you do this calculation because you have a finite probability of stopping at any intermediate index. It's very important. You don't have to say, do it in over three steps, or two steps, or 10 steps. No, because you assign a probability when you stop, 
okay? The algorithm will stop at some k, and you keep taking these averages for the different k's that the algorithm will give you. Uh, so, uh, so that's basically what you get is, you get the solution to be, so you get these uh, samples, um, you know, and you compute this Monte Carlo estimate, and that's basically XI. And most probably, this is the first time that you see solving AEX equal to B, one equation at a time. So you can actually get uh, uh, the component of a vector X without solving all the equations. All right, I don't know when, uh, if you guys uh, get excited with little things, but when I saw this, and this is, I don't know, it's 20, 30 years ago, uh, uh, you know, I got excited. I thought, wow. And the same authors actually uh, have pushed these ideas to solving nonlinear equations, solving eigenvalue problems, and lots of other things. Okay, so uh, let me see if there is. Uh, uh, so if, uh, here is a sort of a, uh, a little uh, uh, two by two example just to see the uh, methodology. So this is a. Uh, the matrix field looks like that, and that's the analytical solution, so it's a trivial problem. And um, so we have basically two indices, right, one and two, and then we're going to have uh, a stopping criteria. And so what, what I do, let me just go back. So what I do is I define the transition from index one to one to be one third, from one to two to be one third, and then one third to stop, okay? And similarly from two, one third, one third, one third. So basically, if you take a sequence, um, uh, actually, let me, let me show you there is a specific thing. If I take, for example, uh, if I sample these indices, one, two, two, one, and then I stop, then x1 um, will be b12, b22, b21, and then uh, b1 divided by the transition probabilities from one to two, which one third, from two to two, which is one third, this one third, and then stopping one third, and you get minus two. Uh, if you repeat this, all right, if you repeat this with different uh, samples of this, uh, uh, what I call Markov chain here, uh, and you start taking samples, you basically converge uh, precisely to the exact solution of AX equal B, but one component uh, at a time. Uh, so you may want to appreciate the fact that if you want to solve AX equal B, uh, and X is very high dimensional, let's say it's a million dimensional, and you only care about a few components of X, this calculation will save you an enormous amount of computing time, right? An enormous amount of computing time. Um, so you will go, usually when you solve linear system of equations of, with matrices N by N, the cost is N to the cube, all right? The cost here is N, times s, which is the average length of uh, uh, these chains that you build in, and uh, uh, capital N is the number of samples that you need to take from Monte Carlo convergence. So you go from n cube to n times little s, little uh, capital N. And uh, these methods, literally, uh, there is, uh, you can, uh, the reference is there. If you want, you can read it in comparison to everything you learn in school about very many different methods, these methods are extremely efficient, okay? Uh, now, if you really care about all the components n, right? So then the cost becomes very similar to many other iterative methods for uh, this linear system of equations. But if you only care about a few components, okay? The method basically beats every other method. Uh, if you are interested in using uh, Monte Carlo methods for nonlinear equations, for eigenvalue problems, uh, integral equations, it's all there. All right? Uh, everything has been done. Okay. All right, so, um, uh, so let's move from the important sampling. And uh, uh, I'm going to try to uh, Tell you a little bit of uh, things that you will need here and there for your homework. Okay, so basically, uh, we would uh, like to introduce uh, uh, incremental strategies for uh, 
you know, for uh, uh, doing type of Monte Carlo approximations. And uh, incremental can mean that basically uh, either iterative methods, all right, where we start taking some samples with the hope that eventually will be the correct samples from the target distribution, or can be sequential methods where maybe uh, rather than taking samples from the two distribution, we'll create a sequence of distributions that at the end will give us samples uh, from the target distribution. So these are ideas that go with uh, Marco Chain Monte Carlo and uh, also these methods uh, sequential Monte Carlo. Uh, and I will uh, cover sort of both approaches uh, uh, in the following weeks in details because they're very important for your research. So today I'm going to give you sort of a superficial uh, understanding of uh, what uh, uh, MCMC is, and I'm going to wait for sequential Monte Carlo maybe later in uh, in uh, in November to cover those topics. All right, so I need to uh, do some jumping on slides now. All right, so let me actually maybe not too much jumping on this yet. So let me. Oh, what happened? Uh, okay, so let me. Um, uh, jump to uh, 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 give something which is a particular class of this type of problem. So let's motivate it. Um, let's put all of these things up. So this is a standard example that is referred to in many books to motivate give something. So think that you have uh, 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 a nuclear uh, plant that has uh, multiple pumps. Uh, in this case, we have 10 of those. And you count uh, the number of failures of these pumps at uh, uh, given times. So basically, uh, you may already have seen this in uh, other courses. When you want to model failures, basically you do this with a Poisson distribution. So here, um, if each pump fails with a parameter lambda i that defines this uh, distribution, uh, the Poisson distribution, effectively the number of failures is a Poisson distribution uh, by uh, defined by lambda times uh, the time. So this gives you the number of failures for, let's say, uh, a given pump at time ti. Okay? So the idea here is each pump fails following uh, a Poisson distribution with its own parameter lambda. Uh, I'm going to define shortly what beta means. Okay? So let me uh, uh, in case you forgot, by the way, this is how the Poisson distribution looks like with parameter theta, 1 over theta factorial, lambda to the power theta e to the minus lambda. Um, so uh, this parameter is lambda in the Poisson distribution. I'm going to introduce a hierarchical model for them so I don't have to calibrate them uh, in detail. So I'm going to take lambda i to follow a gamma distribution. And the parameter beta in the gamma distribution is going to be another gamma distribution with hyperparameters gamma and delta, just to make things interesting. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I am going to write uh, uh, the uh, uh, I'm going to write this uh, uh, the posterior distribution. So um, what is this? so I have the product, all right? The product of overall pumps, and I have ten of those. So what is this? This is really the likelihood term because it gives me the failures of the pumps, right? And each of them fails with parameter lambda i. And I have uh, uh, basically, I measure the number of failures at time ti. So the parameter really in the uh, Poisson process here is lambda i times ti, OK? And uh, uh, so I measure the number of uh, failures, OK? This is pi at a given time ti, so this is where the Poisson distribution comes. All right? Then uh, we said that uh, uh, each of the lambda i's follows a gamma distribution, so I have to put this inside the product as well, all right? So this is the product, basically, of the priors for each lambda i. That's a gamma distribution. And then beta uh, is the same uh, for all of them, and it's a gamma distribution with parameters gamma and delta. So you can actually think here, all right, because we do hierarchical modeling, uh, this parameter beta is the parameter that links all the pumps together. So we're not, you know, if somehow we were putting an index i there, right, 
is like modeling each of this independently. But the idea is, since beta links all of them together, we're using information from all the pumps to actually make inference. Because you know maybe one pump never fails. So how are you going to be able to do anything about that? Maybe another pump fails all the time. So you do this by having a parameter beta that is shared, shared by all of them. Bottom line, uh, the, uh, we have a posterior, okay, given our data, that involves this parameter lambda and this noise parameter beta. Okay? And this posterior looks like that, and it's, of course, unnormalized. I simplify it here like this. Now, uh, if you try to use any of the methods for sampling from this posterior, uh, you're not going to make any of them to work. So if you try to use the accept reject methods, they will not work. Uh, if you try some uh, transformation methods, they will not work. It's too complicated. If you try important sampling, it's not going to work. So we need uh, something else. And something else, basically, is this genius idea uh, that goes with the name of Gibbs sampling that says, you know what? Rather than sampling all of these parameters simultaneously, and uh, we have actually, if you notice, we have 11 parameters because we have 11, 11 lambdas and one beta. So it says rather than sampling all of them simultaneously, how about if you sample iteratively one at a time? Now, I'm going to tell you what the algorithm looks like, and you have used it already in your homework, right, when you did model selection. Obviously, when somebody tells you don't sample these 11 things simultaneously, sample one at a time, there's no guarantee that whatever way you do it, that actually sampling one at a time, it will actually give you samples from the distribution of 11 variables. Right? I mean, if you start saying sample lambda one this way, and then lambda two, and then lambda three, etc., there's no guarantee why at the end the samples you generate are really samples that are coming from this. Okay? But the Gibbs sampling actually will guarantee that, okay? And so let's see how it works. So the idea here is uh, uh, the, uh, to be able to apply the Gibbs sampling algorithm, you're going to have to compute the conditional distribution of each of the parameters given all the other parameters, okay? You remember you did this in your homework. And uh, the idea here is this conditional distribution, you can actually immediately see what they are, right? So if you look, for example, the condition distribution of uh, lambda 1, you can immediately see that lambda 1 follows with everything else fixed. It's a Poisson uh, distribution. You see that? Lambda 1, some power, e to the minus lambda, etc. Similarly, you know, lambda 2, etc. And if you look for beta, you know, actually you can see that beta is also a gamma distribution. Beta comes here and on this exponential, so it's a gamma distribution. So bottom line is, you can, uh, in this problem, you can immediately write down analytically that the conditional of lambda i, right, uh, is a gamma distribution. And uh, the same thing for beta is another gamma distribution that looks like that. So here is what the algorithm says. Uh, start with some values of the parameters. Sample lambda 1 from uh, uh, this, keeping all the other parameters constant. Then sample lambda 2 from this, keeping all the other parameters constant, and etc. And then sample beta, and you keep doing this. Then at the end of the day, the samples you get will be samples that are actually coming <coughs> from this joint posterior distribution. OK? So uh, let me see if we formally have the algorithm written somewhere. Well, here's the algorithm, OK? So uh, for each i, from 1 to 10, you sample, uh, uh, given all the other parameters, you sample uh, lambda 1, then lambda 2, lambda 3, etc. cetera, OK, uh, from this gamma distribution. But the way you notice here, the way this is written, there's no lambda 2 or lambda 3 or anything like that coming. So this looks uh, way, so this is actually not only the conditional of lambda i, it's actually the marginal. You know, there's no lump, there's no dependence on the other parameters the way that I see it. Okay, so that's easy. But when you look at the conditional of beta, that depends on lambda one, lambda ten, and it's this gamma distribution. 
So again, what has been accomplished, rather than sampling from a distribution that has dimension 11, you sample 11 times from uh, distributions of dimension 1. Now again, I'm going to say, but you know, this iterative takes too much effort, you know, etc. Well, yes, um, but sampling directly in 11 dimensions for this problem is not an option, right? You cannot do it. Okay, so this is uh, uh, very powerful. All right. So effectively, what have we done? This. So let me try to, you know, I'm going to tell you uh, in infinitesimal little things. So we can uh, 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 move on in the lecture today. So what have we uh, literally done here, right? Um, effectively, we are going to create a chain of samples of the parameters. You know, we start with some values, and then we keep moving. Uh, we update, basically, the samples. And this chain that we create is called a Markov chain, OK? And the way we actually create this Markov chain is by defining what's called a transition kernel. So, you know, given the values, let's say, of the uh, variable x at state n minus 1, somehow we have a rule that tells us what's the probability of xn belonging to some region or just taking a given value. And we call this the transition kernel. All right, so basically, in, uh, in the Gibbs sampling, there is a transition kernel, all right? But somehow, given the previous state of the parameters lambda and beta, it tells us what to do next. And uh, it's hidden. You don't see it. I gave you the rule. I said we sample from the conditional. So I'm going to try to generalize this to Markov chains and give you explicitly what is actually the transition kernel that allows me to go from xn minus 1 to xn uh, in the context of Gibbs sampling. Uh, even though. The, the way we generate samples of the parameters lambda, right, uh, we correlate them. Because you say sample uh, lambda 1 given all the other parameters, right? So it depends on all other parameters. We cannot really guarantee that somehow uh, we can use this estimate as the Monte Carlo approximation uh, that we have seen before. Because in Monte Carlo approximation, the samples are independent of each other. There is no guarantee, basically, nothing here. The samples are correlated. Well, yes, but as n goes to infinity, actually, this is true. And actually, indeed, the samples are samples from the actual distribution part, even though they are correlated. OK? So um, basically, what we learned from Monte Carlo, uh, asymptotically, the same thing. Uh, it is true with certain constraints that uh, we will, uh, you know, if I have time, I will at least uh, uh, casually mention and we will see them in detail uh, in follow-up lectures. So this requires a number of constraints in the way that this transition kernel is defined, okay? But under some weak conditions, it is possible that indeed this will be the case. So uh, just a simple example, okay? Um, we uh, of uh, a Markov chain here is uh, an autoregressive model. So basically, we pose a rule on how to go from x n minus one to x n. Uh, the noise we use is a Gaussian. Really, this is a random walk. Okay, uh, uh, this is what this right. The probability of x n given x n minus one is a Gaussian. Okay, so uh, I can tell you that if you do this problem theoretically, this chain that you see there converges to this exact Gaussian. All right? So we actually know what the right answer is going to be. But if you know you want, you, what you can do is write a, a little program. Start from any distribution of xn minus 1. Take samples of this. Let's say at x0 to be samples from a uniform distribution. And then following this rule, Keep updating Xn and keep getting new samples of X1, X2, X3, X1000. You will find out at the end of the day that those samples are actually samples uh, from this exact Gaussian, which is the limiting distribution of this uh, autoregressive model. And I'm going to show you a picture that demonstrates. Uh, all right. So, uh, for example, if you uh, uh, this is you know. Uh, 
uh, your target distribution is a Gaussian. If you take samples that they are uh, uniformly distributed, and then you start moving them with uh, this random walk, after about 100 steps, you basically all your samples are coming from the Gaussian. Okay? So, um, I mean, this of course is a simple example, but you need sort of to appreciate that under some conditions, uh, we will be able with uh, 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 good luck basically to converge to the actual target distribution and then uh, we can guarantee if we do multi count approximations that actually would be, would be valid. All right. So actually, uh, the, uh, so basically in uh, summary, right, uh, like we did in Gibbs sampling where we generated samples of these uh, lambda parameters and the beta. Uh, so we somehow, uh, if we sequentially uh, uh, you know, have some rule to uh, generate the samples, asymptotically when n is large, all right, uh, uh, we will uh, be able to approximate uh, expectations under the true distribution pi of x, but actu by actually taking the samples from the chain and doing the regular uh, Monte Carlo estimation. I mean, if you think this is sounds uh, not being right, because when you generate samples, sample xn depends on the values at step n minus 1. So all of these are correlated. But if you all take them together, all right, uh, and somehow do this type of calculation, then this is a good approximation of uh, the exact expectation the way we have seen with Monte Carlo. Not only that, you can actually show that asymptotically the rate of convergence uh, under some constraints is actually 1 over square root of n, the same thing as uh, vanilla Monte Carlo type of calculations. All right. Um, so the, uh, there is a number of constraints that need to be satisfied when uh, you generate these chains. And, um, uh, uh, so I'm going to try to give you progressively at least the buzzwords for them. So the first one is that the desired distribution P from where you want to sample needs to be the invariant distribution of the transition kernel P. So I want you to look at this equation and tell me if you physically sort of understand it. Uh, I remind you that this transition kernel P of X and Y is a rule that tells you if you are at X, uh, you can move to Y. So we want with that transition kernel to eventually create samples from the true distribution pi of x. So it says for this to be happening, right, the distribution pi needs to be an invariant distribution of the Markov chain, which implies this equation. So I want you to look at it and tell me if you understand it physically. What does it say? I mean, at the end of the day, right, if pi of x, if all the samples are going to be coming from the two distribution. So when uh, you're at x and you move to y for all possible values of x, what should you get? You should get p of y. OK? So, uh, so in many ways, this equation is uh, sort of uh, an obvious argument here, all right, uh, if you're at x. And you transition to y, all right, uh, for all possible values of x, you should get pi of y, OK? So, uh, so this is one of the constraints that are going to be required for us to be able to approximate uh, expectations with classical Monte Carlo estimates. And even more importantly, to claim that asymptotically xn are samples coming from the true uh, target distribution pi. So there is um, uh, uh, two more. OK, let me go back. Um, I don't know if the slides are on these things, but because most probably we will not have time to discuss all of this. So there are two more uh, very important requirements uh, to make this to work. All right, so we mentioned that pi has to be, um, so the first requirement that we had, uh, it was uh, this uh, equation. But there is an additional requirement, two of those, uh, that have a lot of substance there. And one of them says 
the chain has to be irreducible. And this is not actually uh, something to take in a very light manner when you develop uh, uh, algorithms. So what does irreducible mean? Does anybody know? So I have this chain and we want it to be irreducible. Maybe the, the English word is uh, uh, not the best for what is intended for, but what does irreducible mean? So think, right, that I, this is, what, let's say, the space, the 3D space, is all potential values of this variable x, OK? So you start from here, and then you have a rule. You move there, you move there, you move there, et cetera. What will be a requirement that you will expect this transition kernel to satisfy to be able to actually sample the whole of this rule? I mean, would you be happy if I keep moving here around and never come there? So how should we state that requirement? with words, basically. We need to be sure that if we start at any location, there is a non-zero probability for that location to be anywhere in the domain of the distribution. I mean, if I can reach there, means I will never see that sample. I will never be able to generate. So I will never be able to say that I actually sample from the true distribution. I need to have uh, a finite probability that I can go from any location to anywhere else. So this is, in common sense, you should not allow to be stuck in one domain, OK? Because if you get stuck, basically, you'll be exploring locally. You'll never be able to go somewhere else, OK? So this goes uh, with the name irreducibility, finite probability to go from any location to any other location. And then your chain needs to be aperiodic, OK? Uh, effectively, when you explore the space, uh, you should explore the space uh, not in a periodic fashion. So if I, let's say if I am going to visit you, right, and I'm from here and I move around, etc., I should not visit you every five steps. I should visit you maybe now in five steps, then next 35 steps, 1,000 steps, million steps, but not every five steps. This is what is called uh, aperiodicity. So when uh, the previous equation, irreducibility, and a periodicity are satisfied, you can actually prove uh, mathematically uh, that the chain will actually give you samples uh, that are coming from the true uh, target distribution. Uh, I don't want you to take sort of these statements light, right? Because in many problems that you play with complicated data, somehow you're going to have to use some perturbation of existing algorithms because you know, you need to fine tune things. And if you fine tune, you no, know, if you're going to do random walk, what steps do you take on the random walk? Well, I can take very small steps, and you know what? I will never be able to explore the whole space. All right, so if, let's say if I'm here and I can only move, you know, uh, a millimeter, I will never be there. All right? I mean, never in my lifetime, basically. OK, in a finite time. So we basically need to be sure that the selection of parameters uh, and transition kernels we do, they satisfy these conditions. All right. Uh, so let me uh, demonstrate this transition kernel back to Gibbs sampling. And I'm going to use, uh, that's the easiest example, actually, to do it. I'm going to assume that the target distribution has two random variables. It's two dimensional, theta 1 and theta 2. OK? and um, uh, so this is how the, uh, you know, we start with uh, some values of theta, theta zero, okay? And uh, we sample uh, uh, at step i, we sample theta one from the condition of theta one given theta two. But you notice, what do I use for theta two? I use the values of the previous iteration. And then I sample uh, theta two, and what do I use for theta one? the value that I just sampled, OK? So um, OK, so I'm going to ask you shortly, if this is on the next slide, to tell me what's the transition kernel for this problem? Yeah, well, ah, let me remove it. You guys tell me. So I want you to look at this and tell me, uh, what is the transition kernel of going from theta 1, theta 2 to, let's say, theta 1 kernel, theta 2 kernel? What is the transition kernel? What is the rule 
based on these two, uh, this algorithm that tells me how to go from theta 1, theta 2 to theta 1 prime, theta 2 prime. What's the rule? So what's the transition kernel that, uh, you know, uh, tells me how to move from theta 1, theta 2 to theta 1 prime, theta 2 prime based on this algorithm? So the, you said multiply of those two, right? Some sort of. So let's say we need the rule for going from theta 1, theta 2 to theta curl 1, theta 2, curl 2. So would you agree? Uh, when I sample theta 1 with this conditional, I keep theta 2 to its previous value, theta 2. And then without theta 1, I use the condition of theta 2 the, uh, given theta 1 to sample this curl theta 2. So the transition kernel for Gibbs sampling is this. All right? Remember, uh, and we will see this when we do, you know, in, uh, uh, other algorithms here, the transition kernel is not the same as the importance distribution, right? The transition kernel gives us the probability rule of going from uh, this sample to the uh, updated samples on the next step. And in the Gibbs sampling algorithm is really the product of these conditionals, but you have to be careful uh, in the notation. This is the new sample given the old one, and this is the new sample of theta 2 given the sample of theta 1 that we just um, sampled from the first conditional. Make sense? Okay? Now, you may ask, uh, does this satisfy actually this, uh, uh, is Pi an invariant distribution of this transition kernel, uh, P of X and Y. Uh, by the way, um, uh, another uh, word that is used basically, it's most probably more common for this equation, this is called the detailed balanced equation. Okay? People actually who play with Monte Carlo methods in biology, in, uh, in uh, chemistry, you know, um, they will, uh, you know, this is uh, the detailed balanced equation. So the question here is, uh, if we're going to really have any hope for this algorithm to keep something to work, the really the first thing we need to um, uh, demonstrate is that this equation is satisfied. Is it satisfied? Well, it's just a little bit of algebra, and it's nothing actually to it. And I think you really need to do the algebra to appreciate uh, that you understand what the algorithm is. So what I have here is I have p of x, so that's p of the original samples. And then I have the transition kernel from theta 1, theta 2 to theta 1, theta 2 curl d. Uh, d theta 1, d theta 2, right? And uh, so let's see what happens here. I put things in blue so they are easy for me to even uh, uh, make sense out of it. Uh, I write the transition kernel with the definition we have there. That's what it is. So I put this in blue. There is theta 1 only coming on this term. So when you integrate this in theta 1, what did you get? You get the margin of theta 2. All right? So you have the margin of theta 2. So if I uh, mix those two together, I get the joint of curly theta 1, comma theta 2 times this condition of theta 2 given theta 1, d theta 2. And uh, when you integrate this in theta 2, what did you get? The marginal of theta 1. And those two together, they give you the joint of theta 1 theta 2 curly, so actually you can see the detailed balanced equation satisfied. Okay? Um, you can actually prove the, uh, the rest of the conditions as well, uh, so I am going to actually, um, you know, uh, we don't need to discuss this. So certainly for the Gibbs sampling, you can actually, at the end of the day, uh, uh, when uh, uh, you uh, take the samples, you can guarantee actually that they're coming from the target distribution, okay? Um, and uh, so certainly you can do your Monte Carlo approximations. And uh, if you really want strongest statements to actually say that uh, theta 1, theta 2 are samples from pi, you can do that uh, as well. So this is a much stronger uh, uh, requirement. Okay, so we mentioned those with words, we don't really need them. 
Okay, so um, uh, I'm going to give you two versions of the Gibbs sampling algorithm, and then we will move on. All right, so here is uh, here is the uh, uh, I have a theta is a vector with p dimensions. P is greater than two. Okay, so um, uh, a little bit of a notation because we are going to update one variable at a time. So let's call this variable k. When you see this theta minus k is the vector of all the variables theta except k. All right, that's a standard notation. So when you see theta minus k is all the variables except k. So what you do is uh, you are sampling from the conditions of theta k uh, given all the other variables. And you have to be careful what all the other variables, what values are they going to take, okay? And um, uh, notice here, the variables from 1 to k minus 1 have an index i because I already have updated them from the previous step. And the, all the other variables, k plus 1 to p, have not been updated, so we'll be referring to iteration i minus 1. Okay? Um, so again, uh, it's minus k, but also pay attention to the indices uh, on the top. Um, all right. So this algorithm uh, goes basically with the name uh, systematic uh, Gibbs sampling because you uh, sample in sequence basically theta 1, theta 2, uh, uh, theta i, etc. Okay. Uh, there is actually uh, a better algorithm. Can you think of an algorithm that uh, may be sort of uh, more efficient than doing things in sequence? Give me your own algorithm. So here we have a vector of p values, right? And we sample in sequence theta 1, then theta 2, then theta p. So give me something else that uh, may be even better. And actually not even better, the algorithm would even be one line. Not like, uh, you know, many lines, you know, just one line. Or two lines. So rather than uh, sampling in sequence, what else can you do? How about if you say, look, from all the variables 1 to p, let me randomly select the one to update and keep doing this. So how are you going to select which variable to update randomly? What would be the rule? You're going to be sampling from where? From what distribution to figure out what variable you update, if it's going to be 1, 2, or p? You know what? Uh, I, I have uh, hearing problems. From what distribution? The uniform distribution. All right. So that's the algorithm. All right. So this is called the random scan uh, uh, algorithm. Um, so basically, we will sample uh, an index k from the uniform distribution over the indices, 1 to pi. And uh, uh, we will uh, set all the other variables to whatever values they have. Okay, as before, and then we just update the uh, theta k, and then uh, that's it, done. So basically, if you don't go in sequence, you say start updating randomly whatever index you select through this. Okay, so that's why this algorithm is called a random uh, uh, scan algorithm, and um, um, uh, you can actually do even uh, fancier things, right? There is a lot of versions of this, rather than uh, sampling one variable at a time, uh, sometimes it may be to your advantage to sample blocks of variables together. So rather than s sort of, in this case, updating a variable k, you may want to update, um, you know, several variables simultaneously, because maybe those variables are so highly correlated that it makes a sense to actually put them together. And so the algorithm in that case, it's actually uh, called uh, uh, block Gibbs algorithm because you use conditionals, but conditionals over blocks of variables. Okay? The nice thing is, right, if it will take you literally uh, one minute to find the best algorithm in any language you want anywhere because people have worked these things out for you. But you need to know what they are. So when you write a paper and you say, I'm using Gibbs something, you can actually add a line 
and say what gives sampling, you know, you're using, etc. Okay, so uh, things they they are not magic; they have some, um, you know, they come from somewhere. Okay, so um, uh, so what I have here is um, I have a way to actually take samples from uh, bivariate distribution with uh, a correlation coefficient rho. So in this case, I give you exactly the conditions are also Gaussian, very nice uh, distributions. Okay, x1 given x2 and x2 given x1, and uh, and actually uh, let me actually uh, go fast through the uh, things. So if you look at uh, the histogram of x1 that you generate, it actually you know uh, it's a uh, it's a Gaussian, and uh, this is the x1 x2 plot that somehow tells you that you are not stuck anywhere. You notice things are more or less all over the space, okay? But then look what happens. Uh, if you take the correlation uh, coefficient to be 0.999, all right, and you look at the sample of x1 and x2, this is how the change of events go. So it's like, you know, you get something, you know, then it moves there, and then, you know. So do you explore? Are you concerned about it? Yes, of course, you should be concerned. It doesn't seem that you explore the space correctly, and you know the pro that you have troubles because the histogram that you get, it actually doesn't match the Gaussian. Okay, so uh, so in this case, we need to, you know, um, uh, you have an issue basically. There is a lot of implementations of this with nice animations. Uh, so if you want to implement the Gibbs sampling actually for the bivariate distribution, literally, uh, if you want to do it uh, sort of in a one line, uh, two lines code, you know, this is given x2 how you update x1, where this is a sample from uh, a standard normal, and here is uh, updating x2 given x1, a sample from standard normal. These are the coefficients, the covariance metrics, and uh, so, uh, uh, and you can follow basically how uh, accurately you represent the distribution. Uh, you can do this for a Gaussian mixture, right? So uh, uh, if you have um, uh, two modes, you need to be sure that somehow when you do give something or any other algorithm, you're not basically trapped in one of the modes. Uh, so you can see here, uh, it seems to work. You generate samples from uh, both modes. Uh, uh, and uh, um, I think, uh, in one of the presentations, you can imagine actually on this problem, right? Uh, if you do, let's say, random walk and you start with some samples, maybe if the random walk has very small steps, very small variance, you will never escape from the mode that you started, so you'll never be able to jump from one mode to another, okay? So you need to be able to jump from one mode to another, otherwise you will not get the right answers. Uh, I don't think I would have time to tell you about Petropolis Hastings, so let me uh, give you an example, and I think that example comes from the book of uh, Bayesian Core, uh, and it's a cute example, okay? So, uh, something that uh, basically the Gibbs sampling, uh, it's not obvious that it's relevant, okay? So, uh, you have a, a likelihood model, and you collect two samples, uh, x1 and x2 from the likelihood model, and the likelihood is basically a Cauchy distribution. Okay, so the, uh, you know, remember the Cauchy distribution is one over pi times uh, this term inside parentheses. So you have two samples, i, i, d. So the likelihood looks like that, and you want to compute uh, the mean. You want to inference based an inference on the mean of this uh, uh, of this Cauchy distribution. So you're going to put a prior of this. So you put a prior that is Gaussian, and then the posterior looks like this. So my question to you is, can you apply give something to this problem and uh, tell me, you know, does it even make sense to talk about give something about estimating mu in this problem? How many parameters have in this problem? Only one. So what give something am I talking? There's no give something here. Give something, you have to have more than one parameters, right? And compute the conditionals and all of these things. So if you try to uh, play with other methods, right? And this can be 
uh, sort of uh, a very painful homework, try to do very shorter methods, uh, you are not going to succeed. Here is a trick how we're going to make Gibbs sampling to actually work on this problem, even though we only have one value. All right? Um, so I give you uh, uh, the trick. You can actually show that 1 over each of these uh, terms, uh, 1 over 1 plus xi minus mu squared, it's actually the integral of e to the minus omega i times that from 0 to infinity. Help me now. How can I do keep sampling or why it's relevant? Why is this equation relevant? Now we have two parameters, omega and um, uh, So now what we can do is uh, we can actually uh, work in a space of three parameters, mu, omega 1, and omega 2, OK? And uh, do give something in that space. And actually, once we're done, the only thing we need to do is keep only the samples in mu, right? Because those are the only samples we care. This, by the way, doesn't look like a very weird approach. In a lots of problems, it may be easier to work in a bigger space, all right? Even though you don't care about many variables in that space, but somehow, when, let's say here, when it comes to sampling, you can actually uh, use Gibbs sampling uh, in the enhanced space, okay? And uh, then only uh, maintain the samples in mu, and that will give you, uh, and uh, will give you basically samples from the actual uh, posterior distribution. So uh, how the whole thing looks like? Uh, so you uh, work on this uh, enhanced space, okay? And uh, uh, you can, if I ask you what is the conditional of mu given this coefficient w, or if I ask you what's the, uh, the condition of w's uh, given mu, the answers are actually uh, uh, exact. So the condition of mu given the w's is a Gaussian. And um, uh, the conditional, what is it? The conditional of omega uh, given the mu is an exponential distribution. You remember when we discussed about the transformation methods, I told you how to sample from the exponential distribution. So this is Gaussian. So you do give sampling of this problem. And when you do give sampling, uh, there is, you can actually generate samples from uh, uh, a distribution that's sort of a product of uh, Cauchy and, uh, and uh, Gaussian terms, and it looks very well. Okay, so again, uh, we uh, do this, uh, we get rid, we don't care about the samples. Remember, when you have a Monte Carlo approximation with many different variables, and you want to marginalize, you only keep the, the, the particles for the variable of interest, the rest are integrated out. So here you computed the samples on the Ws, uh, but you marginalize them out and you don't care about them and the only thing you do is you keep the mu's and you do a histogram and that's the actual distribution uh, that's coming up. Um, I, I, don't, uh, I mean, I already have done this, right? But I remind you, um, uh, you remember this problem? Uh, this was uh, what you worked on the homework, where we use, uh, 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 you know, we had basically um, uh, a regression model, and we wanted to figure out uh, how to select the input variables that are relevant to explain the model. So we transform a regression problem to a model selection, and, uh, uh, and we introduce uh, basically uh, uh, you know, the sort of the syntax is gamma k that define the variables that they are activated. And somehow uh, the calculation was not very complicated, but you use this, I want to believe you use this in your homework correctly. You compute it a margin, I mean, a conditional of gamma k given all the other variables, and somehow uh, together with the conditionals of um, uh, the coefficients beta and the variance sigma uh, in the model, you were able to effectively do uh, give sampling. And uh, at the end, somehow, you were able to evaluate uh, uh, 
uh, everything in the problem, right? Even the marginal likelihood. And uh, so you had an algorithm that was looking like this. Right? So you were basically uh, doing a selection over models, and then for each model you were updating the parameters and you keep iterating on this. And this was sort of a, a weird uh, form of doing deep sampling because uh, you were mixing uh, continuous and discrete variables in uh, doing this type of things. Deep sampling is extremely powerful, okay? It doesn't work in many uh, uh, important problems, but deep sampling may be a small part of other very complicated algorithms. It's essential. You need to know it, okay? And the next algorithm uh, that you need to know is uh, uh, Metropolis uh, Hastings type of algorithms, and we will discuss those, uh, 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 you know, later this week, okay? All right, so I'll see you. Uh, I'm not going to tell you I'll see you. I will see you. That we will have a lecture on, on Thursday. That's as much as I can say. Okay, so I'll see you. Oh, yes, yes, yes. You saved me. <laughs> no problem. Thanks.